science project, project in the last year and a half. Uh, and I must admit that even though we're using them, I'm not sure we've actually caught any errors directly by the pilot saying you did something wrong. I must admit that. We, but it could be because we're good programmers. It could also be because we're not applying the contracts that much yet. So now I'll start uh, going through each kind of uh, contract elements uh, we have in either 2012. Uh, come up with some comments and a small example. Uh, we'll start with uh, precondition and uh, from the rationale for the year 2012 standard. It's an obligation of the call. Call us to ensure that something is in order before you call the sub program. And it's a guarantee for you to ever implement the sub program that this, this will be true once you call. And uh, I just came up with an example. Uh, even in data 2012, they haven't actually put any of these contract aspects on uh, much of the standard library. So I decided just to take some examples from the, the TextIO API data. So we say we want to put a string to a text file. Well, we better make sure the file is open first. So this is one example you can put in on a precondition. Uh, still, in this case, we could of course have a race condition that, well, once we call it, it's okay, but the OS dismount the file system or make some other strange things. Meanwhile, so the operation can still fail in this case, but it's a nice minimal requirement at least. Similarly, we can look at uh, post conditions, what the staying after talking to us when you the sub program. That's an uh, <coughs> obligation of the implementer of the sub program to make sure that this is true once the sub program returns. And it's a promise of our hand to the call on that. This is how the world will be afterwards. And uh, I decided then, okay, let's take the line in the uh, TechIO API. And uh, Ada has, depending on your view, a nice or annoying and annoying departure feature of keeping track of line numbers in the file when you're writing to it or reading from it. So actually, we can say that after you've done the line, the, the line number has been incremented by one. So that's an example of a post condition. Here, I reference the value of the line number before calling to this hyphen node. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to teach you the details of the syntax of data in this talk. That would take more than an hour. Uh, so, but there are lots of good references for that. That was. Uh, Pre and post conditions then uh, time and variance. Uh, this is an example I've adapted from the 2012 rationale. Uh, imagine you want to have we want to talk here. We want to have a time able to represent points on the unit list. I was a mathematician once. So. Points is here. <coughs> We can start by just saying, well, we do it in rectangular coordinates. Yeah. But then uh, the flow then it could be anywhere, then we put limits on minus one to one, and we get it into this box here. But we don't want it to end up on here. We can do that with a time invariant that the distance from the cargo shouldn't go beyond one. So now we have a type here for managing points on the unit disk. Of course, there could be any kind of condition here. But uh, the point is that this is something that the 
compiler now is obliged to ensure the objects of type is point B. But it, has all, it always has to be true. Yeah. You could actually very a big point derived from one that was just an arbitrary point where you say for A can be anywhere as far as our building point type represents. And then this is a subtype of the subtype constraint. Then uh, the other kind of variance that's uh, dynamic uh, subtype predicates. That's kind of constraints subsetting um, subtypes. Uh, I take a nice little example here. A prime. It's an integer. It, uh, it can't be less than two. Uh, and uh, you can't have any factors into the number which are different from one and the number itself. Which, if we look carefully here, we say that prime mod was n to zero. That happens for some n from two up to prime minus one. Then it's not that our dynamic predicate is not true. Uh, so now we have a subtype of integers which is only the primes. Unfortunately, uh, you can't do fancy stuff by looping over a subtype of the dynamic predicates. Yeah, you can do that with you can do the standard predicates, but not dynamic predicates. But you can at least make, now you can just, the, the lazy test now for which integers are primes is to just loop over all the integers and uh, see if you can, if, it's in the subtype prime. Uh, of course, it's not necessarily computationally efficient, but that's a different matter. Uh, this is an example for, from an actual project uh, where there was a decision somewhere that these organization UI could not be longer than 256 characters. And to avoid that we accidentally in our program try to put larger screen, longer screens into our database, we make this subtype where we put in a dynamic predicate and the length of these strings. In older versions of ADA, you could do something similar by creating a bounded string which could have length up to 256 characters. But all of the work doing that, uh, this is much easier. And then, I said before, it was dynamic subtype predicates. Static subtype predicates, they are more limited in what, basically it's the same, but it's more limited which expressions you're allowed to use. Uh, you can do anything where your subtype is in a statically defined set or part of an otherwise static expression. Um, the sum operations you can do at least. It's not all. Uh, but this is one of the cases. Look it up in the reference manual when you get to it. Uh, and uh, I was in Mauritius recently working for a small data company there. Uh, so I decided, well, we'll make a nice example. The, the summer going from November to April. Uh, I was there in the window, but that's good, I'm sorry. Uh, so now we have a type of month, just made the short. This is an example of enumeration types in data. Uh, and then I make a subtype where I say, okay, the summer month, that's from November to December, and then from January to April. And then I declare an object. And then uh, I accidentally switch back to Northern uh, Hemisphere mode and say, well, July is a summer month. Right? Find that with the compiler, you get the warning. That doesn't work. You get a you get a failure because July is not the summer subtype. Uh, 
Uh, there's a similar example in uh, the year 2012 rational, but it's been written by an Englishman. And he's clearly not used to the concept of that's the sum of people from November to April. So he does it with a window from December to January to February instead. The effect is the same. And then I talk about uh, coverage check. Here I have a well, not very nice example of a case statement. <coughs> level is, if there's the level of some logging messages, the severity level. And then we say the different operations where to send the messages depending on the level. It's split out in the case statement. But what would happen if I accidentally forgot to put in the alert level. Uh, what would happen would be that the compiler would say that I'm not covering all the possible values of the type of level, and uh, it would stop compiling my program. Then I have to go here and do something. Uh, it's not directly contract, but it's a very useful <laughs> static implementation check. Uh, and it, it relates to the subtype <laughs> of this uh, value you put in. So that was uh, a quick overview of contracts in the year 2012. <coughs> now, say it looks like he's seeing if I got everything included. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, I'm I've done my best to put some guidelines together to get a consistent use <coughs> of contract-based programming in ADA. Uh, when I started, I just put things in and write it up when I sort of felt like, well, we can put something in here. But it's better if you do it consistently across the application of your library. And, uh, the place I like to start when I'm programming, that's with the types. So uh, make sure that you make a good detailed declaration of the type and its constraints. You declare type or subtype, depending on the requirements of compatibility with the other type you want to be able to cast directly, or if it should be really a unique type that you should not expect to copy back and forth. Uh, you can put appropriate constraints on your values. I had the example with the, the points where I put the constraint that the floating point coordinate shouldn't be less than minus one or larger than one, uh, as an example. And then you can add extra examples, extra constraints, if it is relevant, as uh, predicates or invariants in the time. But I think you'll see that in many cases you don't really need that. This is enough in a of a contract for the time. Uh, uh, I go back to my integers in my prime example. It's, it's nice. We start off with this prime to integers. And uh, I decided here that, well, it's really an integer. It's not that special, so it's just the subtype of integer. If I thought it was really something special, I would say prime, type prime, this new integer, and it would be a new type, just, just having to be derived from the integer type. Uh, and then there's this about primes being larger than one. I put the range constraint on. And Primes are nice because that's not enough. We also need to uh, keep track of the only factors is one and the prime itself. So, an example, uh, maybe concrete, but these scientists might have to say so. I haven't used it in real code. I did use Spark once to uh, validate a 
application to find primes. And we found an error I hadn't found in my testing. I was impatient. If I had let it try to run to the end, it would have failed around there because there was some mismatch running over the edge of the number of that integers to be processed. It took some time to figure out that it was that that Spark was telling me it was wrong. But, uh, it's definitely useful, and it's useful in cases where you might not have the patience to find it by testing. Uh, I know also that the Spark people have been involved in testing a cryptographic uh, hash function where there's, there's a bar in the, the reference implementation. If you give it a uh, 2 to the 64, 5 long data sets to hash, it gets the wrong value. And nobody had apparently had tested that. So the bug is still there, even though it has been reported. But then, back to the main story. Uh, now we have declared our types. Uh, the next step, that's uh, the sub-programs which are going to operate on these types. Uh, I'm not going to into detail about the sub-programs themselves, but when we know which ones we need, make sure that we are as specific as possible about the arguments. So we select the proper direction of each argument. And uh, we select as specific as possible a sub-type for each of the arguments. And if we will claim subtypes can't do enough, then we can continue and use pre and post conditions to declare new stronger constraints. Okay. In my example here, that's a nice symbol and the compiler probably be able to figure it out except in self example of increment procedure to increment the counter. Uh, so well the counter has to be incremented so we first have to go in, we modify it, go out again, and we say we want to do it with arbitrary steps. So that's something that, that just has to go in. And well we both integers. <coughs> well actually counting we start from zero. There can't be less. That's natural numbers. And we say we're incrementing, so the step can't be zero or less, so it's a positive number. These are predefined uh, subtypes of integer and integer, by the way. So now we've put some constraints here on the calendar and on the step signs. Okay. This is something you've always been able to do in ADA. Uh, some of the next steps that here, that's it, is the 12 specific. Well, uh, we put in a precondition. Since we're going to increment the counter, can't already be the last possible value of our integers. And the post condition, well, it will definitely be more than zero. Uh, and, but we can do better than that really want to. Uh, and so we can go the step further say we should have steps which will make the counter go beyond natural last. The other one is really a subset of this one, but that's a math exercise and we're not about to do, to do that today. <coughs> so that was uh, the first step with our sub-programs looking at the arguments. The next step, that's what are the requirements of our sub-programs? Which preconditions do we have? Are there any special requirements which should be in place before we perform a sub-program? Can a sub-program only be called once in the whole run of the application? Can it only be called when the application is in a specific state? And uh, this, this is what we can document uh, uh, conditions to such program. And here first I go to the, I go back to the tech IO example where uh, writing to a file 
traffic conditions. Fire should be open. But it should also be part of the brightness so maybe that would be an outfire or end fire mode. And another example of that here, I imagine I have a variable or function telling me about the state of the system. And uh, initialize should only be called if the system is with non-initialized state. When I get to the uh, work, work on an actual time source example, then we'll have something like that to look at. Because there's a, a bug in the API that DJ has provided me with. So that's good. I like that. Things to work on. Uh, and then uh, the next step back is looking at likely sequences of calls. So we have our types, we have our sub programs, functions, and procedures. <coughs> what are the likely sequences of calls in these sub programs? Uh, and specifically, with these sequences, as the promises from the first one, uh, does that include the preconditions and the next one being called so on in, in the chain? Uh, so we want to call what should we say initialize. system is initialized. And it initialized doesn't have the post condition that the system is initialized. We have a problem. So that tells us how we figure out how to add those conditions. We can see that here's a Uh, 
then we will know that it is open when we get down here. Everything's fine. But it's this exercise, it's in a way it's relatively trivial. The hot knot is actually making up this sequences of life, likely sequences of calls. Once you have the likely sequences of calls, it's really trivial. Uh, mostly trivial. Uh, but still, you have to do it. And then uh, it's time for some source code I didn't write myself. So it's not, it's not written quite for this purpose, but rather for uh, static analysis and experiments. Uh, 
do some smaller font. It's, it's big enough that everybody can read, right? And it's still big enough that everybody can read. Also in the back row. Okay, good. So this is uh, the specification, the external specification of the cellular automator uh, simulator. It sets up a lattice that it's operating on. It has a constant saying, the source where we're putting in sand, uh, and some parameters uh, shaping the decisions. Here. And then we have the actual operations. Starting and stopping, adding and weighing, going to the next step in the iteration, and uh, showing the current state. But without any pre imposed conditions. So, what we could do is that we could, we, I would start to say we could find a time describing the state of the automation. And what can be be uninitialized? It can be uh, switching. inside it and uh, as far as I can see after we had start we can start it up again that's why I, I don't have a separate state for being uh, uninitialized beforehand and having started again. Then we we want to be able to check our start state. So we specify a function that returns an automation state. Uh, so now we actually have enough information up here that we can start to add post conditions, first three of our operations, we can see the follow procedure. So we say, well, there's no parameters, so there's nothing there. It's all work in an internal state. So we say we start, our start procedure has a first condition, which is that it is initialized. State and equal I'll, initialized? What? State equal initialized? Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If somebody remembers. Mm -hmm. And starting, similarly, And the other ones, they, they don't change anything. So, so this is what we have. Uh, uh, my, my first take on what are the post conditions. So going back to uh, That's because I say, what do we do? Now, I'm, I'm not doing it right. Uh, because really what we should say is that, what do we need? That's not all right. You didn't call, catch all the errors in the way. Because, you know, this can yes. Then adding a brain, we can only do that we saw we got the constraint error. We have the precondition that we are initializing. State is initialized. And the same is the case for next and show. We're not initialized, it doesn't work. Are we now? Uh, 
statement, we say that what we do is we say start, and then we say at range, then we say next, then we may say show. And then we may go back here sometimes. And then sometimes we say stop. And preconditions here that is initialized. And we can't, the stop edge attempts to deallocate. And if it tries to do that, um, would better be in uh, And start, it's good to be uninitialized because otherwise I, I know there'll be a memory. And uh, if some of, some of you are wondering why I put in the switching state in between, it's because uh, behind the scenes, there's actually a task in it. It's a parallel processing program. Uh, so uh, in case some function somewhere might be asking while we are changing the, the states, uh, I suppose we better have the possibility to say, we're, we're switching state at the moment. Uh, which means that I really have to make the variable where I keep track of the state should probably be Atomic. Uh, and uh, we could just put that variable in here. Um, notice it's this private. The uh, package specification is separated in the public part, which is the one that the users of the package can see, and a private part, uh, which focuses on uh, uh, details about uh, the, the data modeling. Uh, but you can also do uh, certain variables in the private part uh, instead of moving, moving them all the way to the implementation. Ten minutes left. Ten minutes left. Actually, okay. five minutes. Ah, five minutes. Ah. If, you, if you allow time for questions. Ah, we should have at least time for questions. Then we should have uh, uh, So, uh, when we go through here, so what did we say? We said, now we have also variable giving the state. Uh, Start. Well, it is initialized after we've done it. But before we said it should be uninitialized to avoid uh, memory leaks. Control of uh, 
data flow, it wouldn't be a problem because we know that it doesn't change the state. But we better here go in and say, well, uh, actually the post condition of that we're still initialized. Uh, just to make sure that we don't get the problem with next. Now we actually we have enough to do something interesting. You remove the initialization. Yes, uh, but no, I'm, what surprises me is that I, I expected the post condition and start to be the one that failed. But you never call start. You remove the call. I remove that call. <laughs> That's why, yes. So maybe we should go in and. Uh, so we get the right error, yes. So we go in and. Uh, Activate start. And now we have something that locks up. Uh, we have any. Uh, did you go? Are there any race conditions in your application again? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, race conditions. <laughs> uh, so, uh, now we get an assertion failure, but uh, at least if the compiler works, then we know we should, we should get an assertion failure and exiting automation stops. Uh, so now we go into and say now that we talk about the state, we'll actually go in and say so we switch. to stop by pressing Q, we will end up stop and stop will start fine, but an exit we have not said it's uninitialized, and then we should get an assertion error. Fake post condition line 37. Yes. So uh, we can see that we can work we can play around with these 
in those conditions. And uh, we still have a few seconds. I'll go and notice. No, I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Bad style. <laughs> uh, in, in ADA, you can declare enumerated types as I did for those making states. So a case like this, you really make a state type which is uh, empty, settled, and then you write out this representation array with the characters, also making sure that you say that empty gives you space and settled gives you the lowercase error. But that's it. And then uh, there's not so much, but most about things I've said. And uh, you can find uh, source code examples here, my website there. Uh, and then uh, I'll put my slides on my website. Uh, All the slides will be put on the Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll publish mine in a few minutes. Now I know how they look when I get the presentation. Any questions? <coughs> Any which are short enough? Or? I was just wondering uh, with, about this example with the with an invariant that uh, guarantees that a point is with on a uh, unit disk. Yes. I was wondering whether when is this check actually enforced, and how will that impact performance, or when whether I can even use such a well complicated, let's say, invariant in practice. Uh, it is forced. Uh, forced. Uh, let's see, subprogram X6, uh, type conversion, uh, uh, yeah, it's basically enforced each time is, you access the, let's say, the interface, which is any time you have it, It's time you do something which could change it. Right. Which is, yeah, the conversion. Type conversion and returning from some uh, program. The return from the program. Uh, one that has it as a return value or return. So yeah. If it's just an in, nothing will be done. Yeah. But yes, it, it might uh, impact performance. Yeah. Uh, my view is uh, I prefer a slightly slower program which give me a correct result than one that gives me an incorrect result. If I want one that gives me an incorrect result, I can do it pretty quickly anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your speech, but uh, I'm an AFL programmer, so we have... Um, you had stuff like this for a long time. Yeah. Right, for a long time. One of the issues uh, in the implementation are about uh, recursive calls in evaluation of uh, the recognition or post-condition. Yeah, I, uh, it is resolved. I can't remember the details, and I'm not one of the people who have to implement the compilers. Jose, can you remember uh, the details of how the standard resolves the issue? No, I remember that. I'm pretty sure I've seen something exactly about how to yeah. resolve that issue, but yeah. I can't remember the details. So, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you with the details there. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind uh, trying to figure it out later. Thank yeah, you. Uh, I think the, the problem you mentioned is when you have something like stack full with a precondition not stack empty and stack empty with a precondition not stack full. <coughs> that right. And in ISO, if I remember correctly, uh, accessions are disabled while you are checking another accession. Yes, implementation differs uh, depending on compiler. But it, it arrives when, for example, you say, uh, okay, my result is not the result of the function that's it, that yeah. is prefixed with not. Well, that's what I said. Typically, yeah. not full. Yeah. Empty implies not full, and full implies not, not empty. Uh, uh, I remember we discussed that. Um, I mean, uh, in, during the, the 
design of the language, uh, I can assure you that there is nothing like disabling in certain contexts. Now, how you uh, solve that one? Um, I mentioned this morning that the reference manual is freely available. <laughs> no, no, but also you have an HTML version of that, and you have another one which is called the annotated reference manual. And in addition to the normative text, you have comments that explain the rationale, the decisions, and the things that have been discussed when designing the, the standard. So in a case like that, the best thing is to refer to the annotated reference manual. There is certainly something about that. It doesn't say recursive, recursion. You have it? Yeah. Yeah, but do you have the annotated? I haven't one? got the annotated installed, no. no. Uh, I put a pause. Activate the network. Well, just type annotated in a reference manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I turned on the network so I wasn't distracted while presenting. <laughs> well, maybe you could take that offline. Uh, yeah. well, I think we should do that online because uh, we have another presentation coming up now. But let's look it up. And So the, the next presentation is about the